This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Thank you so much for, for coming out on this uh, unusual evening of fires and, and tumult in San Diego. We appreciate you being here. Um, I'm Dan Atkinson. I'm the uh, Director of Public Programs for UC San Diego Extension. And it's my, my pleasure to welcome you all here for this evening's talk with Pico Iyer. Uh, this will be the final event in this year's Helen Edison Lecture Series. And I want to mention the Edison series was made possible by a major endowment gift from the late philanthropist Helen Edison. Uh, she supported numerous local educational, cultural, and arts efforts. Uh, many of you may know her name from the uh, Globe Theater, which she, she helped to rebuild many years ago when it burned to the ground. Um, in accordance with her gift, we present annual public lectures on issues that advance humanitarian purposes and objectives, re representing the work of leading figures in a wide variety of disciplines. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce our interviewer for this evening, Peter Gurevich. Peter's the founding dean of UC San Diego's Graduate School of International Relations and Pacific Studies, and is a distinguished professor emeritus in the Department of Political Science. His publications include Political Power and Corporate Control, The New Global Politics of Corporate Governance, and uh, Politics in Hard Times, Comparative Responses to International Crisis. And he's also written on issues uh, related to US-Japan relations, international relations after the Cold War, and so forth. So please join me now in welcoming Professor Gurevich, who will introduce Pico Iyer. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And uh, I, I must say it's a great honor for me to be working with uh, Pico Iyer this evening. Uh, he has uh, rapidly become one of the great commentators and writers of our time. I was trying to think, I was, how would we categorize him? What category is he? Travel writer? Yes. Novelist? Yes. Commentator? Yes. Moral philosopher? Yes. Uh, observer about life and times? He's all of those things. And I think in that way, he joins the company of some of our, the, you know, the world historical writers, Flaubert, Wordsworth, people, who Graham Greene, whom you write a lot about. And so I think he's all of those things. And um, he has become famous. He's written 10 books. He has art. He's written for Time Magazine, New York Times, New York Review of Books, all of those things. His theme tonight is weapons of mass distraction, keeping our sanity and balance in a high speed displacing world. And I see that as a theme about uh, how all, the, all these technological things, the, the cell phone, TV, the internet, airplanes, all these things move us around, and how they're both indispensable but also fragmenting and destructive to us. And so I'm really looking forward to talking about that. I find it kind of interesting because on the one hand, I, I appreciate what's destructive about all those things as I am vulnerable to this. But at the same time, that's the technology that has allowed us to do this. Uh, Pico and I have been trading emails. I watched a TED talk of his. I read electronically on my iPad some of his material. I read some of his articles. We had a phone conversation, and I feel in a way we become friends because of this technology, which is also in other ways destroying our lives. So we, <laughs> we've become friends, even though we literally had not met until an hour, an hour and a half ago. And I feel I'm about to have a conversation with somebody that I know, you know moderately well as these things go. We also discovered that at one point we had to stop one of our email exchanges because we both had to go to traffic school. <laughs> since we had both been in violation of the laws of the state of California in somewhat different ways. And I told Pico, you don't have to go to traffic school. You can do this online, see? But, um, but anyway, I really feel that this medium that we're going to talk about its destructive quality enabled us to do this. And so I have great pleasure 
of sharing with you the experience that I've had of becoming a friend of Pico Ayers. And so I'd like to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Pico Ayer, and <laughs> let's start the conversation. And so Pico, I'd like to talk, start out by talking a little bit about what home means to you. I think your background, as you describe it in Global Soul, is really quite incredible. Your parents are from South Asia, so you look like somebody from South Asia, but you said, I don't speak any word of any language in South Asia. You went to school in Britain because they moved there, and so you sound sort of English. But you didn't stay there very long because they moved to Santa Barbara. Hmm. And then you came with them to Santa Barbara, but you went back to continue school there. So you have a bit of Southern California in you, but at the same time now you live with a woman in rural Japan in a small town which has absolutely no <laughs> way of communicating with the world and you don't speak very good Japanese and she doesn't speak very good English. So you're kind of an amazing person. And, <laughs> and what, I mean, we all travel. You know, I bet you everybody in this room loves to travel. That's one of the reasons they're here. But I think most of us, when we travel, we have a strong sense that we're at some point going to go home. You know, we think it would be fun to live there. And you think about that, but then you go home. I like to know, what does that mean to you? Do you ever, do you have a sense of home? Does it bother you? Not to have what you said. I don't really feel, one of your sentences, I don't feel comfortable really being uh, any place that feels like home. I'd like you to Talk to us about yeah. that. Share that a little bit. I just want to keep listening to you. No, put no, me no, in the no. same They're sentence as Wordsworth you, and Graham Greene, and that never happens to me. But home is where I am right now. And you know, it's interesting you said that I was incredible by virtue of growing up in those ways. And actually, I would say in the course of my lifetime, that's become the norm. So it's true that when I was a little boy, I felt like a, a mutant mongrel hybrid with this funny little kid with Indian features and a somewhat English voice and an American residence. And it's hard to remember now that when I was nine years old, for example, I, in England, I'd never seen another dark-skinned kid. And when my parents moved to California, it was, uh, Indians were a real rarity in Southern California, as many of you remember, until maybe the 1980s. So in those days, it seemed very unusual. If I walk around this campus, certainly, but the whole of San Diego or Los Angeles today, it seems that most of the younger people are much more complicated than I am and have many more homes. And so this notion, I grew up, to answer your question, with the sense that home was a work in progress. So it was like a mosaic in which I was constantly getting to draw from many different places to try to put them together into a stained glass hole, but it was a stained glass hole that was in movement with the high expectation that around any corner there would be new places, such as as you mentioned, Japan, with which I had no formal connection, but would feel like home in a very deep way. And so home was something constantly evolving. It was like a sentence you never really wanted to complete. And when I thought of my grandparents growing up, who had a very fixed sense of home, it was almost as if they were given these little cards when they were born, saying, this is your race, this is your caste, this is your tribe, this is your religion. By comparison, I thought having multiple homes, fluid and evolving homes, was a great luxury. And I was really lucky. But I never guessed growing up that by the 21st century, my background would seem the opposite of incredible and very simple. We were, oh, actually you weren't there, but I was in a classroom earlier today. And as I looked around the table, I thought most of these kids probably have five, six different places they can legitimately claim as home. And so their imaginative exercise of stitching cultures together is going to be even more exciting and liberated than mine. But I wonder whether they struggle. I don't have the sense that you struggle with it. You, would, you said, the very notion of home is alien to me as the state of foreignness is the closest thing I know to home. Hmm. Global Soul, page 24. OK. <laughs> uh, I'm a professor. So. Um, but I wonder whether these kids that you're observing, yes, it's changed dramatically. San Diego of 30 years ago is not the same place. But I wonder whether it's more troublesome. You seem very comfortable with this identity. Yeah. And I wonder whether they are. Do you think that Well, you're are? absolutely right. And you know, I think a lot of people feel neither here nor there. I don't fully belong to any community. I fall between the cracks. And yet, that community in itself is growing larger and larger. And so I often might imagine I may have met today a half Taiwanese, half Californian young woman who might feel that she's not fully a part of either community. Right. But as she looks around the classroom, she's surrounded by a half Japanese, half German girl, a half Thai, half Singaporean right. young boy. And their questions are all the same questions. And she is part of this, in fact, very quickly growing, yes. floating community of people who don't fit within the categories. And as you know, 
220 million people now on the earth live in countries not their own. In places like Toronto, they're the majority. And the number's growing so quickly that soon there will be more such people than there are Americans. So I might say to the half Taiwanese, half Californian young woman, you're not a part of Taiwan, community population 20 million. You're not a part of California, population 37 million. You're part of this huge global community, population 220 million, where in some sense you are speaking the language and you're exactly in tune with New York and Toronto and Sydney and London. And all one of the interesting things, of course, is that cities and countries, very much like our own, uh, are addressing the same issue. San Diego is thinking about just what I'm thinking about. How do we reconstitute our identity when 41% uh, of the student body at this university may be Asian American and when there's a significant population from south of the border and when there are people coming in from all directions. And so in some ways, we're all sharing the same question. I think for me, the big distinction is between those of us, like most of us in this room, and certainly like myself, who have the luxury of having to some extent chosen and embraced the situation versus the refugees who never wanted to leave home and ache to go back home and never wanted to address this question, but have had it forced upon them by poverty or warfare or just necessity. And I think they're the ones we really have to worry about. It's right, you're right that the, the half German, half Vietnamese young woman at UCSD may have an identity issue when she's 20, but probably she'd have that same, you know, everyone has identity issues when they're 20. And it, it's nicer to have a choice than not to have a choice. I'm glad that to some extent I can craft my identity because that seems a real luxury compared with my grandparents. And maybe, actually, at this point, I mean, I'm so touched that all of you will, would be here tonight, because I know this, as Dan was saying, is a very tumultuous time for San Diego. And uh, I, I should tell Professor Gurevich, I, I've always thought of my home as being inside me, what my values, my loves, my priorities are. That, in other words, home is something entirely invisible that is with me wherever I am on the earth. But this really came home to me, so to speak, a few years ago. And maybe I'll read a little passage that is much more timely than I would like it to be. But uh, Professor Gurevich was just quoting in this book of mine, which I brought out for the new millennium. So in January 2000, the third week of this uh, new millennium, I wrote a book about how I saw the future was going. And I began it with just this description of a rather typical day in Santa Barbara. And I thought I might read this for two minutes, and then we'll go back to because it's really very much about home. And this is a real event, of course. Suddenly, the flames were curling 70 feet above my living room, whipped on by 70 mile per hour winds that sent them ripping across the dry brush like maddened horses. I tried to call the fire department, but the phone was dead. I tried to turn the lights on, but the electricity was gone. I went upstairs again to see that the flames, which minutes before had been a distant knife of orange cutting through a hillside, were now all around me. The view through the picture windows a wall of flames. I picked up my mother's cat and ran out of the house with two friends who had just arrived to try to be of help, but there was nowhere for us to go. At our feet, a precipitous slope that fell towards the road. On every other side, fires that were rising to a crest. We jumped into the car and drove down the orange-licked driveway to the narrow mountain road and there saw that we couldn't go up, we couldn't go down. Bushes were bundles of orange, and flames were leaping over a slope beside us like dogs jumping at a fence. The way down led to a blaze of burning. The way up led into the conflagration. Beside us on the road was one other vehicle, a water truck driven up by a good Samaritan who found himself now as trapped as we were and stood alone on the road in his shorts, extending a forlorn hose towards the fire. Already the smoke was so thick, we could not even see the helicopters above as we sat in an angry orange haze listening to their blades. One friend and our new companion stood in the road and pointed the water at every new roar of fire that flamed over the ridge. I'd never known that fire moved so fast, so purposefully. We could see it cutting through the slope across from us as if with a letter opener and scrambling up the driveway as if summoned to an execution. We sat in the car, the cat coughing in my lap, and for two hours saw and felt nothing but flames and more flames. After night fell, at last a fire truck came up and led us back down a safer spot, a little down the mountain, from which, as an opera played on the radio, I saw the fire up above lick at my room, 
reduced the second floor to a skeleton, charged down towards the city below. Along the road, a horse was running madly. A man caked in soot appeared, not knowing where he was going. Below, we could see cars burning placidly along the side of the road. At last, after another hour, the fire having already shot into the suburbs below and leaping the eight lanes of the freeway which lead all the way to Canada, we were free to drive down through a wasted world of steaming cars and ravaged houses, the black hills all around wearing necklaces of orange. I got taken to a friend's house, went across to an all-night supermarket to buy a toothbrush and started my life anew. Uh, so this was many years ago, and at that time, this was the um, largest fire in Californian history. My parents and I live way up in the hills of Santa Barbara, and so ours was pretty much the first um, house that the, that fire visited, but it then stormed down right across into the heart of Santa Barbara, leapt over the 101 freeway, and it was a miracle that it only destroyed 550 houses. And um, as insurance policies stipulate, we rebuilt our house pretty much in the same place. And we were told, don't worry, it'll take 30 years for the brush to grow back. And only a few years later, we were surrounded by fire again, and then again, and then again, and then again. Four times in 18 months, we were receiving reverse 911 calls and mandatory evacuations. Uh, and so and I wrote about those more recent fires in, in my last book. And so, of course, I began the book with the, these fires because it's a dramatic event. But I think more because, to me, it really spoke so forcibly for that metaphor of what happens to you when literally the foundations of your life are raised to the ground and when your past and your future are pretty much reduced to ash. Because really, these were pre-computer days, so my next maybe eight years of writing all were up in flames, and kind of my boyhood dream of being a writer disappeared on that day. And also, I mean, I think the most fundamental question it raised is, how do you construct a sense of home in the absence of a house? Because, of course, the day after the fire, when the only thing I had was a toothbrush, if somebody asked me, where's your home, I couldn't point to any physical construction. It would have to be whatever I carried around inside me. And I guess I also wrote about it because I'm guessing and hoping that very few of you in this room will ever have to go through a burning house. But I'm fairly sure that one point or another, maybe more than once, you will suddenly lose a loved one, or suddenly a doctor will come into your room with a dark expression, or one way or another, in a moment, matter of seconds, your whole life will be overturned, and what you regarded as your roots will be swept out from under you, and suddenly you have to rethink home. And of course, if you're in any mystical tradition, the whole world is a burning house, the self is a burning house. But so I read it less about the fires themselves than about the sense that I think most of us have to think about what is home, and it's probably not going to be connected with the nationality on our passport or the house where we're keeping our things. That's part of it, but it may not be all of it. And I'm guessing, you know, if somebody suddenly asked you, who are you, Peter, in the deepest way, you would talk about a lot of things you care deeply about, but I'm guessing uh, the country whose passport you carry or the address that's on your identity, driving license, whatever, are not the first things that would come up you would define yourself in some ways very different from the physical, probably. And so in that way, I think it's not so unusual that more and more of us do affiliate ourselves with something uh, deeper than the nation state. Yes, although that's, uh, that's all very, very fascinating and uh, very a lot of complicated ideas uh, going through my head because what are, what are the things that you then, what did you find you then turned to to construct yourself of who is Pico, who am I? Mm. What did you turn to at that point? Yeah, well, it's interesting because as you said in your introduction, some people think of me as a travel writer and I do move around quite a bit, but I think I can only move around because essentially I never move within. So if my wife were here, she would laugh if I were referred to as a traveler and she'd say, you're wearing the same clothes you were wearing in 1986, you're listening to the same Van Morrison song, I've had the same publisher for 30 years, I've worked for the same magazine for 32 years, I've been with my wife for 27 years, I've been going regularly to the same monastery for more than 20 years. So in some ways, the really important things in my life haven't shifted, which maybe is what allows me to travel. So in the wake of that fire, um, I realized how important my family were, and I, I moved to Japan. That precipitated my deciding, well, it doesn't really matter where I am geographically as long as I'm in a place that makes sense to me and with people I care about a lot. Uh, and it helped me to shed a lot of accoutrements by which I might have defined myself previously. 
uh, and a very good sift sifting mechanism, which of, of course it's easier to lose a house when you are 30 than when you're 60, and so I think for my parents it was much more difficult to, to start anew at that point. But uh, I, just two years before that fire, I had left my quite comfortable job in midtown Manhattan to go and live in a monastery in Kyoto to have a simpler life with fewer possessions. So when the world suddenly took care of that need for me and stripped me of my possessions, I felt there was a poetic justice. I couldn't complain. I'd actually was being given what I told myself I'd wanted. Uh, and, and I think it has a lot to do with self-definition. You know, even as a little kid, uh, sometimes I would think, well, if I call myself an Indian, maybe somebody from Pakistan would rightfully see me as an enemy. And if I said I was American, then for people in the Soviet Union then or Cuba, I'd be part of uh, an evil empire. And if I said I was British, people from Britain's former colonies might justifiably see me as an aggressor. But if I define myself in terms of my passions and my interests and my loves, if I say I'm somebody who loves Thai food and feels comfortable in an airport and is always listening to Sigur Ross and wants to read Graham Greene, that actually may free me from some of the enmities and hostilities of my grandparents' generation and make for a more inclusive um, sense of self. And uh, you were rightly saying in your introduction about some of the virtues of new technology. And as you said so beautifully about us becoming friends without having met, cyberspace has become the perfect metaphor and catalyst for people making friends and defining themselves and creating communities in entirely trans-geographic or non-geographical ways. So. Well, let's go down that theme. Let's talk about the ways in which the, uh, the technology is a weapon of mass distraction. What is it <laughs> doing to our identity? And I have to do, I've got to do something. Wait, let's do this. I'm going to do, uh -oh. you remember that? Oh, no. uh, any of you watched the Academy Awards? <laughs> you remember? Do you remember that she, she did us a selfie? So Aye. let's do that. I didn't think I was okay, going to be with Ellen DeGeneres today. Okay, right here, we're going to do Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> we're now going to take a selfie. I think I have the technology of this wrong, but it doesn't matter here. Now it's your turn. You do my it. turn? Yeah, yeah. No, you, I got to preserve you my you selfie phone, virginity, so to speak. You, you don't want to do it? Next, next thing you know, we'll be ordering okay, pizzas oh, and diving okay. in that in the first three rows. But, uh, it worked. We did. We did a selfie. Yeah, and I, now I, we have to. You, got, you don't want to trust me with your. Yeah, so we've got to turn. So we have technology. to have somebody. I hope that some kid afterwards, somebody under 25, will come up here and tell us how to put this Peter, on Twitter because although I have no idea. Although we're good friends, I'm going to have to tell you now. I only recently found out there's a new field called interruption science. And I was just telling some students earlier today, they have found that it takes an average human being an average of 25 minutes to recover his or her attention after okay. a phone call or something. And interruptions now come every 11 minutes, which is, in other words, we're never caught up. Okay, so I can't so, do this so now, so now we've lost each other for 25 minutes. minutes. No, okay. that's so right. I mean, <laughs> uh, so we stage this to make the point of, are, is this stuff destructive? And so tell us why you think this stuff is destructive, this ability to do this. I mean, you have a whole other career. You could help people to detox. You know, my wife would be ecstatic if I stopped using all these things, and you could train people on how to do it, how to stop doing it. But yeah, well, you have you a very good career now. You don't need <laughs> that one. But, but uh, what's wrong with these? Well, I, I wouldn't Why? say destructive. Yeah. Distracting, but distracting. not destructive. Okay. And it's, I think none of the problem lies in the machines. It only lies in me or the people using them. The machines, I think we all know, have made our lives so much better in all the ways you describe and many more besides. It's just that I think many of us, when we get a new toy, get so fixated on the new, we forget the old and we lose all the sense of proportion. And so to me, it really is like when, if you were suddenly to bring out a bag of Lay's potatoes, potato chips now, I'd start nibbling and nibbling and nibbling and nibbling, and suddenly I'd realize I've got a stomach ache and I've probably got a headache, and it's not the fault of the Lay's potato chips, it's only the fault of me being unable to um, discipline myself. So I, sometimes I, I do all my writing in a room where there isn't a computer, and partly because every time when I wake up, even in rural Japan, and I look at that little white box with the apple from the tree of knowledge or the tree of good and evil on top of it, and I think, there's the Library of Alexandria times a million. There's the chance to contact seven billion people around the planet. There's all the diversion that all of history could know. How can I possibly take a walk or read a book or let alone write a book when there's all this distraction there? And it takes real resolve 
to do what probably is going to be most sustaining and turn away from this huge Times Square that is at our fingertips every moment. And I think you know, one reason I moved from midtown Manhattan to rural Japan was the sense that there I had a huge amount of stimulation and information and very little time and space to make sense of it and put it in perspective and think about it. And I felt I had too much clutter in my head and in my life. It was as if I was living in Times Square, which is actually how I feel every time I log on to do my emails. Um, and so I wanted to go to a place where there'd be many more hours in the day. Uh, a sociologist recently did a study where they found that Americans in the 1950s were actually busier at home and at work than we are now, but we feel much busier today. And we all have that sensation of having more and more time-saving devices, less and less time. We can, as you said, so wonderfully contact everyone on the furthest corners of the earth, but lose contact with ourselves. And so I worried that um, the technology wasn't going to be the problem, but my inability to use it wisely was. And the one thing that technology couldn't give me was a sense of how to make the best use of technology. In other words, no information manual came with the Apple machine or with the informational revolution. And that it was only by being offline I could summon the sense of clarity and proportion I would need when I was online again. So, you know, I, I don't want to keep on on this theme, but the thing that made the biggest impression on me was when I go to Silicon Valley, I find that the people who are most plugged in and who are wisest about new technologies, in fact, have created the new technologies and made this wonderful world possible, are also the ones who are observing Internet Sabbaths. Uh, Kevin Kelly, some of you may know, who founded Wired magazine and is probably the most passionate spokesman for new technologies, wrote his last book on new technologies with no smartphone in his home, no TV and no laptop. And every week for 24 hours, he goes offline and makes sure that he never turns on any of his devices because otherwise he won't know how to navigate the online world. Well, would he be willing to go on television and advertise to do that since it's destructive of his only stuff he's trying to sell? Yes, and in fact, he, I, I got this information from the first chapter of his book in which he said, I'm writing about these new technologies, but I should say that I keep my distance from them. And for example, he'll go for four months traveling around Asian villages and never take a computer with him so that he's anchored in the real world. And he never loses a sense of what is real and virtual. And I think being anchored in the real world is what allows him to see the possibilities of the virtual more clearly than if he were only in that universe. I once went to the Googleplex, and there were two people who were hosting me. And one was telling me about this new program he'd started called Yoglas, whereby he was teaching the fellow Googlers who were yoga practitioners how to be yoga teachers. And the other one was writing a book on the inner search engine which is about how the science has found that meditation helps uh, not just physical health, not just emotional intelligence, but actually intellectual acuity. And of course, all the Googlers around them were getting 20% of their paid time free so that they could come up with ideas they never would be able to do if they were online all the time. And so that was just a small reminder to me that even there they realized that to make the imaginative leaps that make an iPhone or Google possible, you have to be often quite far away from those distractions. And so what are the mechanisms, what are you found in the mechanisms that would enable people to, to break of this uh, addiction of the, I mean that's what I hear you're saying, that's yeah. like an addiction yes, and people should that's stop. Right. So no, well, what I, are the yeah. techniques or well, learn, I think, learn how to manage it at any rate? Yeah. I will say this, is, this wisdom is by no means peculiar to me. I think everyone in this room knows knows about that addiction already, and I'm guessing everyone in this room has already taken measures. My sense is when I talk to my friends, almost everyone I know says, oh, I go for a run every day, or I cook, or I do yoga, or they do something or other to try to recollect themselves and try to unclutter their minds and try to uh, unclutter their imaginative arteries, as it were. So I think we're all at the stage of feeling a bit dizzy and running to keep up with a moment that we can never keep up with. And so I've noticed more and more people, uh, one way or another, trying to incorporate into their lives a hike every Sunday, uh, going to a monastery even if you're not a religious person, one, something to, to ensure that you're not losing your balance. And, um, and people worry about kids, but I think kids who grow up with these machines are very quickly going to find their own way of balancing it. I think it's more our generation that uh, doesn't know quite what to do with these hugely empowering new toys we have. Well, I mean, the parents certainly worry about it, right? It's one of the big things. The parenting is what rules yeah. you have. Yeah. I have four grandchildren. Celia has four grandchildren. We see the parents, you know, how much TV do you allow? How much time do you allow them to have? And things like yeah. that. And I guess a lot of people, though, say the problem is not with the kids playing in the sandbox. It's with the parent who's <laughs> checking her email and getting sand calls and actually not watching what the kid's doing no, in the sandbox. I think that's um, very true. I've so. been 
any number of sessions with my grandchildren watching the parents supposed to be with them checking their emails is upsetting to watch. Yeah. But, and you know, I have, that I have two journalist friends who, again, a journalist is meant to be as close to the moment as possible, but they observe an internet Sabbath from Friday night to Monday morning every, every week. And partly because to restore that almost forgotten form um, known as the family conversation. And as soon as they unplug with their son for 60 hours, instantly they can ensure that their family is a real unit where they're communicating and talking about what they're delighted about and what they're frightened about and then can start the week again on Monday morning. But so I think everybody is coming up with his or her own mechanism. But I mean, in a, if it's an addiction, how do you get, you're describing people who understand that they shouldn't do it and have enough sense of powerful identity yeah. and self-control that they can stop it, yeah. okay? But we know the world is full of people who lack that. Like yes. a, what's the commitment mechanism? It's like, you know you should exercise, but you don't. You know you right. should eat healthy right. or you don't. Yes, yeah. You know you should disconnect and go on a, what did you call it, a Sabbath? A, yes, a detox. A yeah. detox Sabbath. Well, yeah. what about the people who are having trouble doing that? What well, do we do for them? The internet rescue camp. Uh, they have them in China and South Korea. They literally take these kids away and submit yeah. them to cold turkey. And I'm sure the results are violent, but they're determined to get the kids unhooked. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I heard that in the DSM manual of, of psychiatric disorders, internet apnea disorder is being considered for the next edition. <laughs> so that means that it's a genuine psychological condition that psychologists will be trying to find answers for. There's nomophobia now, which is literally the fear of being outside mobile phone contact. Uh, email apnea, which I can relate to, because it used to be that before I would go to sleep, while I was waiting for my wife to come home in Japan, I would sometimes scroll through videos or watch something on TV, even though I can't understand the TV in Japan. Uh, and I noticed that my sleep was much more jangled, and yes. I woke up in a much more fractured yeah. state. And then one day, I thought, why don't I just turn off all the lights and listen to some music? Initially, very soothing music, Bach, Leonard Cohen, later even Green Day, Latter Day Punks. It almost didn't matter what the music was, but just turning off so, so many of my senses and using that 90 minutes to decompress meant, first, when she did come home, I was so much fresher and happier when I greeted her. And secondly, I was easing myself into sleep, and my sleep seemed to be much better, and I woke up really ready to take on the day. And so, and again, I happen to do that, but I think a lot of people do things, whether it's turning off the TV at, on your treadmill at the gym, or um, if you're going on a great date, ensuring that all your cell phones are disabled and nothing can disrupt you. I mean, because that's the foundation of it, that I, I, my sense is I'm happiest when I'm completely absorbed, when I'm so lost in the moment, I don't know what the time is, I don't know where it is, I, whether it's in a conversation with somebody, or a film, or a project. My idea of joy is forgetting myself, and, and nine hours have passed while I'm in something really profitable. And my idea of unhappiness is being all over the place and scattered and restless. So in some ways, it's only self-interest. You're right that it's very hard to cure an addiction. But if we think about what is actually making us happy, doing that all the time probably isn't. And talking to you for three hours, if, everything, if your cell phone was off and you weren't taking it's selfies, would be, <laughs> would be right. hugely nurturing. Right. And I would come out you know, transformed for many days. Right. So, so I mean, it sounds like the important thing if, is to teach people to have an interest in something. Because then if they have an interest in something, they will then have the discipline not to be distracted by this. Well, I don't know if they have to be taught, because I think most people have interests. And the, maybe the drawback is it's so easy to pursue those interests virtually. And it's good to do that up to a point. But no, I think you know, the one thing I find is, um, for example, every, I go to this monastery every couple of months. And every time I do, I feel quite guilty. I'm leaving my poor wife or mother behind. I'm missing my friend's birthday party. I'm ignoring all these pseudo urgent emails from my bosses. And as soon as I get to the quiet place and I spend maybe one or two days in silence, I don't go to any of the services. I just enjoy the silence. I suddenly realize that it's only by going there I'll actually have anything useful to share with my wife or friends or bosses. Otherwise, I'm just giving them my distractedness and exhaustion, which is really no blessing. And so I think it's just a matter of stepping back far enough from the canvas to remember what you care about and what really sustains you. And then we're all capable of making our own wiser decisions, I think. It's like moving away from the potato chips for just long enough to realize, well, actually, a piece of sushi might be much tastier, or you know, there are other alternatives that will be, make me happier as well as healthier. Um, but it's just the initial movement away from that. Yes. I mean, when I hear you talk, so what I hear is, you have very powerful interests and commitments. I mean, I, I mm. guess it's back to the beginning of the conversation. You have your sense of place and home, which mm. was 
you, you can manage all this, these different identities, because you had very strong education, background, your family, Oxford, all these things. You became interested in a lot of things, and that's a very powerful route for you. Mm -hmm. And so when you see these machines, I've got these things I care about. You know, every time I've turned it off, I've been ecstatic because I have time <laughs> to do things. Mm. So I wonder if you could talk about that. One of the things that fascinated me in reading your things is how many reference, how, how you use literature. Hmm. I mean, I, I think a lot of the writing, a lot of the thoughts that you're giving us about uh, the technology, home and all that, you have this very powerful mechanism that runs through all of your writings, yeah. of ref Graham Greene, references to all these different authors. And could you talk about that? I'd be very curious, what do they say to you? What do they do oh, for you? These thank you. Well, I think reading is a form of intimacy, spaciousness, and depth. And so I find I'm tempted, again, in the same way, to browse through lots of magazines. And lots and lots goes into my head, and lots and lots flies out. And every now and then, I pick up, uh, like on the train yesterday, uh, my host here kindly said, why don't you take the train instead of driving down from Santa Barbara? And I did. And for seven hours, I lost myself in a book. And I came out as if I'd been on a journey to outer space to another planet. I mean, so my head was so full of ideas this morning after this seven-hour conversation with somebody I've never, never met. And I do think, as a writer, my job, of course, has changed dramatically in the last 30 years because of these new technologies. So when I began writing, say, in 1985, I would go to Tibet or Cuba, and I would assume that none of my friends or neighbors or potential readers here would ever have a chance to go to those places. So my job was to take in as many sights and sounds and smells as possible to import to people who had no chance of seeing Tibet or Cuba. Now, uh, any one of us in this room tonight can go back to our bedrooms and access on YouTube scenes from Cuba or on the Discovery Channel corners of Tibet that I could never go to. So as a writer, you have to claim those places that no video camera or tape recorder or multimedia instrument can do better. And, um, and that's an interesting challenge for a writer to face because most of the territories that I would try to claim or that literature would try to claim now are internal ones. I think they have to do with memory or silence or some personal engagement or ambiguity. If I, if I go to Iran next week, I can't bring Iran more vividly home to you than uh, a CNN show could. But I can follow some invisible inner investigation into Iran that maybe they wouldn't be able to do so well visually or orally. Uh, so that's one way in which writing has changed, and I think that's what I get from reading. Again, one of the things, the luxuries of living in, in a house where I don't have a cell phone or a TV I can understand or I don't even have to wear a watch in Japan, is I try to spend one hour reading every, every day, uh, generally fiction, often not so good fiction, but even an hour with not very good fiction, I think I, I emerge from that deep ocean um, enriched in all kinds of ways that I don't find when I'm reading the articles that I write. You know, I'm, I'm a terrible culprit because I write a lot for magazines and that stuff is very disposable, really. I, I don't think it ever it sustains me in a, in a real way, reading the magazines that I write for. Mm. But uh, I think a book will, will ideally challenge you and take you to some deeper place in yourself or ask you unsettling questions that uh, just like the best kind of friend might. Well, what do you think you learned? I mean, you refer to a lot of Graham Greene and a lot of these people. You, you, you know, you've gone places that they've been and all mm. that. So what is it about, very fascinating, but in reading them, mm. what did they teach you about the places you go to? Yeah, thank you. I think they're a kind of moral compass in some ways. They're the ideal form of guidebook. I'm thinking of Graham Greene here. Uh, so who's, in some ways, literature is my scripture. In so far as if, if religion is about what do you do with death, how do you extend kindness to the people around you, how do you lead a life that you can be not too ashamed of, I would turn to Graham Greene or Emily Dickinson or Melville or Thoreau or all my other great friends who are assembled in my little apartment in Japan, and I think they have as much wisdom to offer as, as anyone, um, partly because you know, they're about fallenness and lostness and vulnerability as much as about preaching from the mountaintop. Uh, so I think as I'm stumbling through my life, if I, if I were tomorrow to fly to a war-ridden country, which is the kind of place where I've spent a lot of time, where I can't tell left from right and I can't tell right from wrong and I didn't really know how to make sense of it, at least I would feel in Graham Greene there's a companion who's been through this much more and much more wisely and at least is a companion in the lostness, if, if no more than that, and, and somebody whom I really respect as... Um, 
as a believer in humanity. Uh, and belief in humanity has to do with an understanding of all humanity's imperfections, in his case. Um, so they're your moral compass. They're, yeah, your, yeah. they're your church, your whatever. Yeah, they're, as yeah, well as my yeah. delight. Because they're delight, so funny yeah. and they're right. so interesting and uh, right. take me places I could never go otherwise. I mean, I've been lucky enough to travel a lot, but I'm not sure any, any of my physical journeys has taken me as far away as reading Moby Dick or I was recently reading Emily Dickinson's poems. They're like explosives in the mind that uh, send you off to Well, you just said something that really fascinated me because one of the things I was thinking about is that these writers or artists uh, uh, compel us to go see the places that they've described, or mm, they are, mm. you know, I, I was thinking, uh, you know, we go to Giverny outside Paris because Monet painted these lily pads, and so people wanted to go see the lilies, and they go see the garden that he shaped, so what's real is very clear. He created it and painted it, and they go there to see the real thing. No, it wasn't a real thing, he, but they're going there because of him, or apparently the, the lake country was, nobody went to the lake country until Wordsworth described huh, the lake really, country. Huh. So. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, artists in a way are shaping our view of things and what we want to go to. So I'm curious about you. You've written about lots of places. Mm. But you, and I was wanted to ask you, what would you like to be remembered for having gotten us to see or look at differently? Yeah. And you said something just challenging a minute ago. You said, well, because of YouTube, there's nothing physical you can describe yes. anymore. I mean, I can't describe Nepal or yes. the Himalaya, anything. Yeah. So, but there are things that you're trying to describe. What are those? What are oh. you, what would you like to be remembered as Pico Iyer, now the world is, people are gonna think differently about the world <laughs> because of what they've read you describe. Well, I, yeah, I don't think I necessarily need, need or want to be remembered for anything, but what a wonderful question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. And the first thing that came into my mind when you said that was silence. You know, silence, if, if yeah. uh, clearly a lot of my writing of late has been just about what I've been talking about, which is if you go out and travel off into silence for a couple of days, you'll probably see the word world with more delight and with more clarity and with more enthusiasm. And so it's a really good place to travel to. And it doesn't have to be further than, you know, somewhere even within your house, perhaps, but it could be just up the road, which is where I go. And you're absolutely right. You've, I mean, again, uh, you've actually described my work to me better than I could and no, explained no, no, no. it to me because it's true that when I began, if you'd asked me that question 25 years ago, I would have said Tibet because that is the most uh, otherworldly place I've been. And the one place I have ever traveled where I really felt not just on the rooftop of the world, but on the rooftop of my being. I felt that whether it was the altitude or the culture shock or jet lag or many other things, I felt uh, access to some part of myself that I had never seen before and haven't seen since. And for all the sadness that has uh, fallen upon that country in recent years, there's still something really extraordinary and unlike anything else about it. So I would say, well, I've been encouraging people to go to Tibet. Uh, but now maybe uh, silence would do as well, for the reasons that you mentioned, that mm. those people interested in go going to Tibet can do that in La Jolla very comfortably now. Mm -hmm. But then they can do silence too, but we're less inclined to think about it because when we go to the travel agents, it's not on the list of discoveries. And <laughs> even Expedia hasn't got to silence quite yet. So. No, they haven't figured out it. No technology. <laughs> no technology for that. But I think of, when I think of the stuff I've read, I am very struck by the things that you've turned into subjects, which high literature normally, airports, for yeah. example. I mean, I think I'll never go through an airport quite again without <laughs> thinking, well, if I were Pico wandering through this airport, what would I be noticing? Because you're looking and noticing and putting things together, connections, you know, what shops are in this port airport as opposed to the one in Kuala Lumpur or whatever. I mean, you're looking at them and you're finding a subject of looking at them and seeing things that most of us don't. Thank you, yes, I, I, I think uh, Peter is referring to the fact that I put myself through once the most sadomasochistic exercise anyone could conceive, which is spending two weeks living around Los Angeles airport. So I know the ins and outs of LAX as well, none of you would want seriously. to. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I think it goes back to your very first question, which is that somebody who's lived in Tijuana all her life, for example, when she starts writing, will write about her neighborhood and her grandmother and the guy down the street and whatever. And Willa Cather, maybe growing up in Nebraska, will write about that. I grew up in airports. That's my childhood home. That's the terrain that's really comfortable to me. I, I didn't say initially, I was born in England, we, my family moved to California when I was seven, but I started 
going to, back to school in England, to boarding school, when I was nine. So from the time I was nine years old, I was traveling alone six times a year over the North Pole between England and California. In fact, 60s California and 14th century England. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so got very well acquainted with airports. And they came when I started writing. I thought back on airports as part of the landscape of my, my childhood. And uh, you're right. I mean, the other challenge every writer faces is how to do something that hasn't been done before or how to find a new topic. And so when I began writing, I remember when I, I, when I first went, this is a very trivial example, but I hope not quite as trivial as it sounds. I, was, I went when I was 28 to China, and I'd never studied Chinese history. I didn't speak the language. And I arrived in, um, near the Forbidden City in Beijing. And I thought, tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people have been here before me. Probably 80 million of them have known much more about it than I do and could write much better about it than I do. Um, and the same with the Great Wall and the same with Tiananmen Square. What is it I can possibly say to add to that? And I looked around this huge expanse of Tiananmen Square and I saw a Kentucky Fried Chicken parlor outlet. And it was the first in China at that time. It was the largest in the world. It housed 3,000 people. Uh, Chinese people were spending a week wages to have one meal there uh, and in fact they were going there with cameras to take pictures of their family in this remarkable thing which in those days was for most Chinese the closest they thought they would ever get to America. Uh, the pictures were all around the walls of San Diego and San Francisco and Los Angeles the places they dreamed of seeing but felt they could never see. The placemats actually converted Colonel Sanders into a Maoist hero <laughs> you know as a, a person of very modest background who'd grown up and created this uh, global empire that had facilitated everyone uh, and it was nothing like anything you'd see in Kentucky or La Jolla, but nor was it anything that connected with uh, traditional Chinese culture, obviously. It was this brand new meeting place, a collision and a conspiracy between ancient China and contemporary America producing something new. And so I thought nobody has very much written about it or thought it was worth writing about, but something important about the exchange of dreams and the fact that people like myself are traveling from California to Beijing to taste of antiquity and traditional custom, and they are looking to California for liberation for that and for long horizons and the like, that actually spoke to something essential in the human dynamic of, of dreaming of the, the, the other side of the wall or the other person's grass being greener. And that although it was a very trivial thing, it could open a door into something more essential that anybody could relate to. And of course, the only reason that my eye alighted on the Kentucky Fried Chicken parlor, if all of you were in the same place, each one of you would notice something different, but probably not that, was that it was a reflection of me. I mean, it was this strange mix of East and West um, that was having to create its own identity for itself. And that was exactly what I was doing. So um, you're right. KFC hasn't featured prominently in literature before. And I'm not sure what I was doing was literature. But it did seem a completely unprecedented thing that spoke to a timeless universal notion. Well, I mean, I think that's one of your fascinating themes, is that precisely, in a way, you're drawing upon the complexity of your background to put, make yourself an observer and see connections. So mm. one of the things that travel writers do is that they, again, I don't want to type you as a travel writer, you're not, but, but one of the things they do is that they are always a kind of a guide when you're traveling. Mm. So I'm curious when I read your thing, gosh, I wish I, I were as observant as he is. And so what advice, get, I'm a traveler and I'd like to learn how to observe the way you do. Can you give me a how-to? Is there a Pico Air how to travel advice you'd give? How to notice the incredible things you notice when you go to airports or any place? Well, what I'd what, say... What advice do you have for me, if you and, me? If you and I are in LAX tomorrow, yeah. you would be noticing so many things I would never see because of your background, your interest in politics and history and, and Germany and all the many other things of which you're an expert. You'd be instantly fastening on those and I would be blithely sleepwalking past them. Mm -hmm. And I'd, so my advice, broadly speaking, is follow your passions and your interests because I think any person in this room even with Los Angeles Airport, each person would be seeing, seeing something entirely unique based on her complicated compound of elements within her and on her experience and on her background and on her passions that would open a door that would be closed to all of us. So in that sense, my how-to would be don't be daunted or intimidated because I think everyone has something equally valuable to offer in response almost to any subject. So I, I had no gift. All I was bringing to Los Angeles Airport was my mingling of cultures. And what you're bringing is your own very different. I mean, you've, you're a mingling of cultures too, but different ones and a mm -hmm. different complicated past. Right. And so, and I think everyone in here too 
Yeah. Uh, I talked to my wife is sitting right there and she's written a book of migration and she talks about ecological niche. Is that the right, if I have the label right? But she has a, you know, a way of thinking about this. You have to identify what is somebody's cultural ecological niche. Yeah. And you have to figure that out. So what you're saying is figure out what yours is and use that as a framework Yes. For observing and analyzing. And yeah. I think it's not hard to figure out yeah. because it comes with, you were speaking about interests earlier, hobbies. You know, if you're a basketball player, basketball will open a door in China, for example, that most of us would not follow. If you're interested in cooking, go to a market and suddenly a world is, uh, opens up that I could never find in KFC. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever your particular passion is, and most of us know what our passions are, uh, that's the road to follow. I'm looking for a quote because we're, we're running out of time and I wanted to ask you, I think that Global Soul ends with your describing a dream that you've been moved by seeing lanterns at the Obon Festival. Yes. And then you dream of England as home and you wake up contented in Kyoto. Yes. So you say that at the end and I thought, gee, I'd love to hear him talk about that. Can you unpack, how do you interpret that? All the pieces yes. put together. Uh, probably the first rule of life is never try to interpret a dream, especially your own. But uh, that book, as I said initially, began with the book. It's, it's about the progression from a house to a home. So the first chapter is the burning house, and it begins with the, the scenes I was reading at the outset, demolition of everything physical in my world. And it ends with me in my home in Kyoto feeling much more rooted than I had in, in Santa Barbara. And uh, the Obon thing is interesting because I was telling some students earlier today, I think all of us have secret homes. And we've all had the experience that you'll come into a crowded room like this and you'll meet the eye or, of a stranger or you'll start talking to a stranger and for some reason you feel as if you know her better than you know your closest friends. Uh, out of a hundred people, su suddenly you meet the person who seems to be your other self or your kindred spirit. And I think most of us have that same relation with other cultures. Something mysterious is pulling us towards China or Tibet or India or Mexico or Egypt, it's often older cultures, as if, and we feel as if we know them better than we know um, our, the, the houses where we keep our stuff. And so uh, when I was a little boy, my parents would take me into a museum and I would see a 19th century Japanese woodcut and I would feel as if I knew that place better than the road on which I lived. And I would open a Japanese poem and it would go through me in a way that even Wordsworth or Dickinson might not. And then when I was 26, I, I was saying to Dan earlier today, I spent a wonderful, my first trip ever to Southeast Asia. And I had a remarkable four weeks in Thailand, Burma, and Hong Kong. And my mind was reeling. Each one of those places was so extraordinary. And I was flying Japan Airlines. I was living in New York City. And so I had to fly back through Narita, Tokyo Airport, to get to uh, New York. And I had an overnight layover in Tokyo Airport. And I woke up in the morning, and my flight was at 2 in the afternoon. And I thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to kill these five hours? Well, there's a free shuttle bus to the local airport town, the equivalent of Inglewood, as it were. I might as well go and see it. I'll probably never be in Japan again. So I got on the bus, and it was a late October day, brilliant blue skies, but the first touch of, of winter and the sense of darkness coming on and the days shortening and color in the leaves. And I walked down a narrow street lined with wooden houses with the shoes laid out perfectly outside each entrance. And I just walked around this airport town for two hours. And by the time I boarded the plane at two o'clock, I decided I would move to Japan. And I did. A couple of years later, I finished up my business in New York and moved there and I've been there for 30 years. Uh, and then by chance the next year I was going to India with my mother and we spent three days in Kyoto, Japan on the way and without knowing or planning it we arrived in this festival that you mentioned called Obon which is in the middle of August when it's believed that all the ghosts of Japan, the departed spirits, come back and visit their earthly families. So the hills of Kyoto are flooded with lanterns and all the graveyards have different colored lanterns above them. It turns it into a kind of ethereal fairy world almost. You're just surrounded by the sea of lanterns and each one speaks for some departed ancestor who is returning. And later I thought, well, there's an interesting metaphor. <laughs> if you feel like you're coming back to a home you've never had and you're there on the day when all the departed spirits return. That sounds like a bit of a summons too. Uh, so that's why, so that's part of what was going on when 16 years later I finally returned to that same ceremony in Kyoto and that night I slept and I remembered that pivotal moment that had been instrumental in confirming my sense of going to Japan. But also, as you say, it suddenly ended up with England. And there's that great line in Shakespeare's 
tempest, this thing of darkness, I acknowledge mine, <laughs> which Prospero says of Caliban. And that's a bit how I feel about England. I don't think it's the most exalted or noble culture, but I can't deny it, it's me, it for me, and there's a lot of England inside me. And so I was throwing my hands around, my, throwing my arms around the culture that I'd fled and abandoned, England. But I was coming to England in the displaced, translated, in indecipherable form of Japan. Japan's very much like England lost in translation, or it's an England I'll never be able to read. But there's a lot that they have in common. Any of you who've read Kazuo Ishiguro's books know he writes about Japan and he's explaining England, and he writes about England and he's explaining Japan. So it was perfect that somehow I would find my home in Japan and also dream um, about England. And I mean, I guess the last thing I'll say without making this answer endless is that Sometimes I think back that if my grandfather, for example, was really drawn to Japan, he might have been able to read a book about it. Or in my father's generation, if he was pulled towards Japan, he could save up and make one trip there. Or he could maybe find a single Japanese restaurant in his hometown. But in my generation, I really grew up as the first generation lucky enough to first be able to go to the place I dreamed of, and then to actually to live there thanks to technology. Entirely thanks to technology, I can live in Japan 27 years on a tourist visa. All my bosses are in London or New York or faraway places, thanks initially to fax machines and then email and Skype. I can live in the place that makes sense to me and yet easily communicate with the rest of the world and come back in a flash if my mother needs me here in California. And so technology has hugely it's made this whole life possible. And then when I come to a place like this university, I look at the kids of student age, and I think they're going to be able to inhabit and interact with their secret homes in ways I can't imagine, much more fully. And their secret homes will be much more diverse and multiple than mine are. And it's easy when we're in the midst of the chaos of the world to forget all these doors that are swinging open to opportunities that couldn't have been imagined in previous generations that we are heir to and sometimes willy-nilly enjoying, as in my case, living in, in the country I most love, but with which, in which I could never be a grown-up. So that's your moral message, that uh, we should use the weapons of mass distraction to our advantage. Perfect, beautiful, not, yes. not have them destroy yeah. us, but yeah. use them the way Wonderful. you have successfully done. Well, not as I do it, but you're right, well, however you find. You, well, you do it quite Great. remarkably. So, well, <laughs> yes, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Pico. Thank I you. really, uh, it was really wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Thank you.